On the 30th of January, 1945, the pride of Germany's fleet departed the town of Gutenhaven with over 10,000 refugees aboard. Before the day was done, the ship would find itself at the bottom of the Baltic Sea, along with most of the passengers aboard. On this episode of Never Stop Learning, we will be checking out the most catastrophic maritime disaster ever recorded, the sinking of the Wilhelm Guslov. In August of 1936, at the Blom and Voss shipping yard, the keel for a large luxury liner began to take shape. Originally set to be named the Adolf Hitler, she was renamed to Wilhelm Guslov after Guslov was assassinated. The ship was 684 feet in length with a weight of 25,000 gross registered tons. She had five decks and was propelled by two four-bladed propellers, which could get her up to a maximum of 16 knots. With the capacity for 1,465 passengers, she was built for the German labor front as a way to incentivize German workers with a subsidized holiday vacation. During one of her first voyages in April of 1938, the Guslaw found herself battling rough weather in the North Sea. In the early morning hours, the wireless operator aboard the Guslaw intercepted a distress call from the British freighter, the Pegaway. The coal freighter was taking on water near the Dutch island of Tischerling and was in danger of sinking. Rushing to her rescue, the crew of the Wilhelm Puslaw were able to rescue all 19 crew of the Pegaway right before the freighter disappeared beneath the waves. Between March of 1938 and August of 1939, the Wilhelm Guslaw took over 80,000 passengers on a total of 60 voyages all over the European coastline. At the beginning of World War II, in September of 1939, the Wilhelm Guslaw was requisitioned to serve as a hospital ship named the Lauren Chef D. Her hull was painted white with a green stripe which ran the length of the ship. A massive red cross also adorned each side of her funnel. This was until November of 1940, when the medical equipment was removed from the ship and she was repainted to naval gray. This was when she became a barrack ship for approximately 1,000 U-boat trainees of the 2nd Marine Training Division in the port of Gdynia, which had been occupied by Germany and was renamed Gotenhaven. Wilhelm Guslaw sat in dock there for over four years. By January of 1945, the Red Army of Russia was spreading a wave of violence and death as it made its way across East Prussia towards Nazi Germany. Large numbers of refugees were arriving in Baltic ports seeking a way west. This was when the Germans developed a plan that they dubbed Operation Hannibal. The plan was to use 790 German civilian ships to ferry an estimated 1 million evacuees and wounded servicemen out of danger. Orders were given in Gutenhaven to evacuate key military personnel westward via the barrack ships docked there. This included the Wilhelm Guslaw. The crew had mere days to prepare the ship for departure. This was no easy feat, as Wilhelm Guslaw had been docked in the city as a floating barracks for over four years. The crew got to work servicing the engines and repairing other parts of the ship so that she would be seaworthy in time for her departure on January 30th. As the days ticked by, conditions in Gutenhaven deteriorated. An endless mass of refugees continued to arrive with nowhere to go. Tens of thousands begged for access to the ship, but initially only 4,000 were permitted. By January 25th, the first passengers, mostly wounded military personnel, were brought aboard. By January 28th, after days of loading supplies, preparing the ship and boarding passengers, the already overcrowded ship was ordered to take on more refugees. In addition to the 4,000 aboard, the floodgates were released to bring aboard as many women and children as possible. By 5 p.m. on January 29th, 
Close to 8,000 refugees had been counted aboard the Rugusla. All through the night, more and more people were brought aboard the ship until by the time of her departure at noon on January 30th, over 10,000 passengers were crammed aboard the luxury liner, almost five times her maximum capacity. At noon, the Wilhelm Gustloff slipped away from her moorings and began to head towards the Bay of Danzing, along with the SS Hansa and two torpedo boat escorts. Behind this convoy, along the wharf, tens of thousands watched as their hopes disappeared behind a blanket of snow as the ships sailed out of sight. Conditions on the Baltic Sea that day were not kind. Frigid, piercing winds hounded the ship not long after departure, SS Hansa, as well as her torpedo boat escort, developed mechanical problems and couldn't continue. This left Gusloff with one torpedo boat escort, the Leuven. On the bridge, the ship's captain and military commander aboard couldn't agree on the correct course of action to take to avoid U-boat attack. In the end, it was the ship's captain Frederick Peterson's decision to keep the lights on through deeper waters to avoid collision with enemy mines, as well as other ships. To the west, below the surface of the Baltic Sea, was Soviet submarine S-13 under the command of Alexander Marinsko. With the luxury liner lit up like a Christmas tree, it wasn't hard for the Soviet submarine to find her next target. Marinsko followed his target for two hours before moving into a position on the ship's port side. Just after 9 p.m., three torpedoes were fired from the sub towards the unsuspecting luxury liner. For the roughly 10,000 people aboard Wilhelm Gustloff, many might have thought that their nightmares were over, but really, they had only just begun. Before we get into the sinking of the Wilhelm Gustloff, if you've enjoyed this episode so far, give us a like and subscribe to check out all of our other maritime disasters. The first torpedo made contact with the ship's bow, causing the watertight doors to drop, sealing off the area where the off-duty crew had been sleeping. The second torpedo detonated just below the pool where the women's naval auxiliary were housed. Only two of the 373 women occupying the space survived. The third torpedo hit the engine room, knocking out main power and communications. On the bridge, officers noted that the ship took on a five degree list to port and the bow began to dip almost immediately. Lights had gone out across the ship when she lost power, but red emergency lights had been activated. The wireless operator on duty attempted to use the emergency transmitter to send out an SOS, but its range was very limited. Orders were also given to calmly head above deck and reminded passengers not to panic. Sadly, widespread panic had already gripped the ship and was getting worse by the minute as the icy seawater was quickly claiming the Gusloff. Within minutes of the first torpedo, the Gustloff had listed 30 degrees to port, making movement through the ship next to impossible. Walls became floors and stairways became impossible to navigate. Survivors reported chaos everywhere. If you fell <gasps> while trying to escape, you were dead. Heaps of bodies crushed by stampeding feet littered all areas of the ship. One survivor recalled hearing a mother in the darkness calmly telling her children that it was time to die. Anyone actually able to reach the upper decks of the ship quickly realized there was not enough lifeboats, not even close. With the ship's now heavy list, all boats on the starboard side were useless and couldn't be launched. The port side was not much better as many boats had frozen to the deck and wouldn't budge. Many of the davits had also seized and were useless. One boat jammed after being lowered halfway. A determined passenger used a penknife to cut the rope, causing the boat to crash down into the water below, but it remained afloat and usable. This lifeboat saved roughly 70 people. Another lifeboat seized as it was being lowered, causing the lifeboat to flip, dumping its contents 
mostly women and children, into the icy blackness below. In all, roughly six lifeboats were launched successfully. Many passengers caught between an overcrowded sinking ship and freezing to death chose to take their own lives. Many survivors reported hearing multiple gunshots as passengers chose to end their lives before the icy waters chose for them. In spite of the chaos, almost all survivors remember the moment that the ship disappeared for good. At 10.15, roughly an hour after the first torpedo made contact, the ship dipped beneath the waves, taking thousands still trapped below her decks to a watery grave. For those still alive swimming in the frigid water, the extreme cold gave them mere minutes to make it to safety. The torpedo boat Luvum, which had escorted the liner, quickly moved in and the crew tried to pick up as many survivors as they could. The Luvum was able to rescue 472 of Gusloff's passengers. Just before Wilhelm Gusloff disappeared, another large torpedo boat, the T-36, arrived to help collect survivors. As the torpedo boats were picking up survivors, the Russian submarine S-13 was still lying in wait. The sub took aim at the larger torpedo boat attempting rescue and fired two torpedoes. Both missed their target and the torpedo boat responded by dropping two depth charges. These charges managed to drive off the sub, but the underwater explosions didn't help the survivors still afloat in the water. T-36 resumed her task and managed to rescue 564 survivors. In the end, out of the roughly 10,500 passengers and crew aboard the Wilhelm Gustloff when she sank, there were only 1,252 survivors. After the sinking, the fate of the ship was not widely discussed. Given the situation Germany found itself in at the end of the war, this was not surprising. Thanks for watching this episode of Never Stop Learning. If you've enjoyed it, give us a like and subscribe. Do you have a ship that you want us to cover? Let me know in the comments below. Also check out this playlist of other maritime disasters. Until next time.